Hello there, Alaskans, wherever you are. Welcome to the Must Read Alaska Show. Coming to you from somewhere in Alaska. This is the place where we talk about, you guessed it, Alaska. Where we keep the mainstream media on their toes and where we are standing up for what's right and a world run by leftists. You can find out more by heading over to mustreadalaska.com and also checking out the Must Read Alaska YouTube channel for some really great content. But first, let's get this party started. Well, it's good, Alaska. This is Scott Levesque, and you are listening to the Daily Dose of the Must Read Alaska podcast. Thank you so much for joining with me this Thursday. It's a pleasure to have you here. And before we get started into some of this news that we're going to dive into, I just want to remind you that we are trying to get to 150 Apple podcast reviews. We're sitting a little bit over 125 right now, and we are well on our way to making that 150 goal. We need you, of course. And if you haven't had a chance, just takes a second to swipe over and give us a five-star review. And if you're one of those extra mile people, my wife's one of those extra mile people. She's she's always going that extra mile. Go ahead and give us a written review. We really appreciate it. They've been overwhelmingly positive, and uh, we just want to thank our listeners. You guys have been phenomenal uh, as we've continued to roll on with over a year of podcasting under our belt. Just a reminder that every time that we talk about an article, I'm going to let you know what the title is, and it's really a jumping off point. And I want to dive right in today. It's something that I'm sure many of you are going to have an opinion on, and it's under the title at mustreadalaska.com. Don Young joins bipartisan group to approve National Vaccine Database Bill, H.R. 550. Now, I'm sure many of you have an opinions on this, but here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to take this from the actual bill perspective, okay? Now, there are many many Republicans in the House that crossed over to uh, to vote for this bill, okay? 80 Republicans crossed over to make sure the bill moved to the Senate, and that included Don Young. And Listen, Don Young has been infamous for being sort of this bipartisan lawmaker, uh, you know, trying to go down the middle of the road, has a conservative bent, but uh, is, is willing to uh, talk and work with the other side of the aisle. So this is not terribly surprising. If it's surprising to you, then and perhaps uh, you haven't been familiar with uh, Don Young's voting record. But listen, it passed the House 294 to 130. And it's a pretty sweeping bill. Now, this was introduced by New Hampshire Rep Ann Custer. I think that's how you say her last name, Custer. Listen, I was raised in New Hampshire, not born. I was born on a military base, but raised in New Hampshire. And she's a Democrat. And listen, this this bill to me has a couple different warning signs. Let's read from the article. According to the bill, the government would spend $400 million on an immunization system data modernization and expansion, a system it says is a confidential population-based computerized database that records immunization doses administered by any healthcare provider to persons within the geographic area covered by the database. That, of course, is a quote now from the bill. Now, let's, let's read on here. The database would allow the government to notify, again, remember, this is what our were saying that the bill is going to do and the database is going to do. There's already red flags, and we'll talk about those in a minute. Let's continue. The database would allow the government to notify people about when their booster shots are due. Although the system is described as confidential, confidential in in this case means confidential from the public, until, of course, records are indiscriminately released, like has been with the IRS, Department of Defense, Veterans Administration, and any number of high-profile government leaks and hacks. The bottom line is this. I am not in favor of government having any control or information about me that's not necessary to government function. That's what the bottom line is. This bill feels like a gross overreach in two areas. One is spending, which is classic Democrat, overspending. Two is overreach in personal liberties and freedoms. I don't need the government to know when I've had the vaccine, if I've had the vaccine, when I have my booster. There's no need to do that. And I'm really curious about the HIPAA potential in this. I mean, I really am. There is no need for the federal government to know my particular uh, health choices. And again, the logic in this to me is just, it's incredibly disconcerting to to look at this and to say, okay, so there's a sec. 
there's a section of the population who wants to say my body, my choice only in this kind of subunit of policy. When it comes to anything else, it's nope. We want to know. The government wants to know. In particular, with this bill, an expansion of $400 million to this database to be able to not only know citizens' vaccination records, but also notify them, which means you're not just giving them vaccination records. You're giving them phone numbers. you got to keep it updated. So what happens if somebody changes their phone number? We know this, right? We get these calls all the time. You get these calls that are like, hey, is Dave there? It's like, this is not Dave's number, man. Oh, sorry. Like the amount of overhead and administration for something like this it has profound long-term financial economic ramifications. I mean, you're going to be spending millions of dollars yearly to make this database continue to run as effectively. And again, we talk about government's effectiveness when it comes to administration. Everybody knows how difficult it is dealing with the IRS or dealing with you know a variety of different government institutions. It's just because it's got bureaucracy written all over it. Red tape, you got to do a thousand different things to get something that seemingly would be so simple done. That's why a lot of people are for privatization of a lot of public things because the bureaucracy involved in it is ridiculous. But now we're trying to have a bill that includes, for example, in this case, a database of citizenry that has everybody's vaccination, particularly in COVID, in a, in a quote, private database. It's, listen, Suzanne nails it right on the head in this article, okay? How many times have we seen leaks from the IRS, Department of Defense, Veterans Administration, or any other particular government entity? Not only that, but do you think the government is not going to use that information to target unvaccinated people? to monitor unvaccinated people? Listen to this. This legislation would unnecessarily appropriate millions of taxpayer funds intended to expand bureaucracy in Washington. A database solely created to record and collect confidential vaccination information of American explicitly encroaches upon individuals' fundamental rights to medical privacy. Absolutely. Now, this quote is from uh, Byron Donalds. He's a rep from Florida. This was, uh, this was an article that uh, he gave a quote for for Breitbart here. It, it absolutely does. He's correct. This is a gross overreach into medical privacy, and that's what I'm talking about. I don't know how this is not um, a, a violation of HIPAA in any way, but sharing – there's no – absolutely no reason why the government would need this type of medical information unless there's ulterior or different motives. Now, it's not a conspiracy theory thing. It's just the government, I mean, it's, it's no secret. Uh, government collects information all the time. I mean, that's just what it is. He goes on, as a fiscal conservative, I cannot in good faith support legislation that contributes to the Democrats' habitual pattern of reckless and wasteful spending and the intrusive heavy hand of government. It's absolutely true. This bill is not only a reckless use of taxpayer money, but also a reckless overreach in medical privacy, 100%. The article goes on, the bill's main sponsor, again, Democrat Rep. Ann Custer from New Hampshire, man, New Hampshire, the live free or die state, explained that the system will be used to remind, quote, remind patients when they are due for a recommended vaccine and identify areas with low vaccination rates to ensure equitable distribution of vaccines. Guys, I, I don't... It's, it's not a conspiracy theory thing. I mean, we know that information is key for a lot of decision making, but also why, I don't want my information in anybody else's hands except for my own, particularly when it comes to medical privacy. You can guarantee me as much as you want to. The fact is you can't guarantee anything. Not only that, but to, to, to assert that this is only to remind patients of when they have a recommended vaccine is due or to ensure that the distribution of vaccines are being equitable in areas that have low vaccination. That is absurd. That's absurd. That's absurd. I have yet to hear, I've yet to hear a one story, one story that the vaccine is uh, being withheld 
from areas or populations. I've yet to hear it. As a matter of fact, it's quite the opposite. What I hear is the vaccine is readily available. Why, aren't, why isn't everybody taking it? Why don't we have a vaccination rate of 90 plus? So the assertion here that we're trying to ensure equitable distribution of vaccines has never been a narrative until right now. It's never been a narrative. The narrative has always been the vaccine is readily available, and yet Americans, quote unquote, refuse to take the vaccine because they want to name it. They're, they're inconsiderate. They're this. They're that. They're stupid. They're blah, blah, blah. blah. I mean, you can, it, I mean, it's just the name game at that point. Suzanne continues, critics say the bill will allow the federal government to track unvaccinated Americans who could be targeted, segregated, and forced to comply with vaccination mandates. Absolutely. Once you have that kind of data, and listen, it's not as simple, it's not a, it's not a Microsoft database. The old school, what is it? I can't even remember what those old school Microsoft databases were, were called. But it's not just a simplified database. It's not. What it is, is an opportunity for them to review data, find and compile, and to... The, the data science now is well beyond anything that you can think of. The modeling now is well beyond anything you can think of. This is not a simple column database. I mean, the government is not just using access, <laughs> a simplified database. No, no, no. It's much more complicated than this. And frankly, again, it's not a conspiracy theory thing. It's an information thing. It's a privacy thing. It's a liberty thing. That's all. Like, do I really think the government is going to, quote, target me specifically right now? No. No. But as, I mean, listen, any information in the hands of an entity other than yourself can be dangerous. I mean, we have to look no further than credit card fraud, right? It's not even just about what somebody will use the information for. It's the fact that somebody has it stored and it's susceptible to hacking. You can go on and on and on about information hacking all the time. Absolutely. Absolutely. Suzanne finishes, the bill has passed the Senate and was referred to the Senate read twice and referred to the Committee of Health, Education, Labor, and Pensions. I just think, man, we're going down this really weird road. We're going down this really weird road right now. And it feels like there's a full court press on violations of medical privacy. There really is. It, it has been pretty substantial over the last year in particular. Ever since the Biden administration came into office, there has been a gradual increase in the encroachment of government into private matters and personal liberties. And I don't really think that's going to change. I think as this administration moves on and as it continues to face obstacle after obstacle, the, the avenues in which um, the administration is going to try to garner that type of control will just take different forms and this bill's one of them i don't care what you say i don't care if you're you can tell me blue in the face that this bill is meant for the good great a lot of good intentions happen and bad things happen out of those there's a lot of great intentions but bad things can happen out of good intentions and like it says in the article suzanne wrote there have been plenty of times where people have said listen it's great that we have the IRS or the Department of Defense. I'm not one of those, but I'm not saying that. I'm just saying these government entities, yeah, sure, they're great. But that doesn't preclude them from being hacked, leaks happening, you know, even further. Segregating data points, i.e. vaccinated versus unvaccinated. I just don't want to go that route. I really don't want to go that route. I'm curious to what you think. I really am. I'm curious to know what you think because th this is a big deal. Again, you can tell me all you want that, no, we're trying to – and it's so ironic. And we touched on it before. The idea that this would be a great way to s ensure equitable distribution of vaccines, it has never been a talking point until right now. Never been a talking point. 
It's never been. We've never heard that the vaccine has been scarce. As a matter of fact, like we said, it's always been the opposite. It's readily available. Why isn't everybody taking it? And the idea that you would have to give people reminders that they're due for a recommended vaccine is asinine. That is a discussion between the doctor and myself, not, not the government. How crazy is that? I mean, am I the only one that sits here and goes, what is this person thinking? What is this person thinking? Maybe if I go, you know, when I head back east to visit my, my family, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to maybe make a call. I'll be like, hey, Rep Ann, what's going on here? Like, do you think your, your explanations remind patients when they are due for a recommended vaccine? Who makes that recommendation? Who's recommending that? If it's not her doctor, or if it's not his doctor, then nobody should. I mean, listen, you know my whole thing about this. Self-awareness sucks in politics sometimes. It really does. And I'm beginning to think it's not a lack of self-awareness as much as it a lack of... Um, just a lack of caring. However, in the great state of Alaska, down on the Kenai Peninsula... The Kenai City Council has voted unanimously no vaccines, excuse me, no vaccine mandates, and no forced masking. From the article, it's entitled Kenai City Council votes unanimously no vaccine mandates or forced masking. The Kenai City Council has voted unanimously in favor of a resolution stating it opposes COVID 19 vaccine mandates and mask mandates. The resolution was offered by members James Basden and T. Winger and took effect immediately upon passage on, yet, on Wednesday, which was yesterday. On Thursday, the Biden administration, now that they're embroiled in some legal tomfoolery, asked businesses to voluntarily, not demand, but we all know how that works, voluntarily implement President Biden's vaccine mandate after the administration was checkmated by a federal appeals court that paused the mandate while ordering a legal review of the extreme measure that constitutionalists have fought. I find this just rather interesting, and, I, and I, would, I would be curious to see across the country how many towns, uh, maybe uh, cities, it uh, doesn't have to be large cities, but cities, towns, and cities across the United States are starting to enact these kind of council, local government voting mandates. How many resolutions are being passed right now in small towns and small to mid-sized cities that are doing about the same thing as the Kenai did here, the Kenai City Council. Because the idea that the government is going to now hook into your private health care record to know when you've been vaccinated already adds another layer of government overreach into those medical privacy issues as much as it does with the COVID vaccine mandates and the masking mandates. It's really kind of an encroachment issue, right? You start here, and then you move the line down, and you add another layer of overreach. And that's where we're at right now. And so cities like the Kenai City Council, towns, are going to be kind of proclamating, providing these resolutions that say, hey, no, we're opposing this stuff. Now, where the rubber is going to meet the road, particularly with the last story we talked about in terms of a, a database, a federal national database that collects COVID-19 vaccinations. And trust me, it ain't gonna, it's not going to stop there. It's not the only information they're going to collect. It's not the only information they have on many things now, but it certainly is not the only information they're going to collect. What does that mean for these private health information records businesses, like, for example, Epic. How much access does the federal government have to those private business records? Because Epic is a health information record company. It's a, it's a digital health information record company that is, I, you know, Meditech was, was used to be the leading company. Now it's Epic. So the question is, is how far is this going to go? And with the Kenai City Council saying, no, we're going we're gonna to pass a resolution unanimously that says we are opposed to any COVID vaccine mandate, any mass mandate, 
Are you going to start to see this develop and move forward? Are you starting to see cities and towns across the country start to vote on these on these resolutions? And what's the what's the effect of that long term? But I can tell you this: you're starting to see people stand up. Here in Anchorage, I see numerous people walking around without masks, even though we have an emergency order in, set in place for masking. I see many people kind of living their life. As a matter of fact, Providence Medical Center has sort of ended its, its crisis standards of care. An article written on Must Read Alaska entitled, Providence Medical Center Ends Crisis Standards of Care Operating Procedures. Quote, we no longer need to place patients in non-standard locations, and our hospital census has returned to a more manageable level. Don't know what that means, but clearly they feel comfortable. The surge in patients that forced us to implement crisis standards of care is behind us. This is good news. It means we no longer faced with making difficult decisions about allocation of treatments and resources and patient transfers to higher levels of care, the newsletter said that came out from Providence. Continuing on, Providence instituted a crisis standard of care on September 15th after grandstanding their doctors and patients, medical professionals, at the Anchorage Assembly meetings to, in support of a universal mask mandate ordinance which the assembly soon passed against the wishes of many in the community. You guys remember that. The six, well, it only got to five or six days of public testimony, and then the, uh, the bait and switch. Oh, we're just going to do an emergency meeting to pass you know, business that we can't wait on, and then boom, in walks in on a Tuesday, the emergency ordinance, and everybody votes on it, which was a, you know, again, public officials skirting the public, you know, the people that elected them, so that they can pass their agenda and not hear what the public has to say, regardless of it's an echoing of the same thing. Suzanne writes, the Anchorage Assembly's emergency order, which was vetoed by the mayor, but then put in place by a veto override from the Assembly, requires nearly everyone to wear masks, expires on December 31st. Or, or if the, hospital, if the hospitals in the area end their crisis standards of care, and if the number of COVID tests positive test drops below a certain threshold. So what's going to happen? It's December 2nd. Providence has ended its crisis standards of care, the largest hospital. I'm curious as to what's going to happen. Are the assembly members going to readdress this? I find it rather interesting as we move on what's going to happen as as more and more variants come out from covid how how are we both in the state local and national level of governance going to handle these things because it's not going to stop anytime soon it just really isn't and to some the idea of masking full time never removing any sort of mandate is a very real possibility for those individuals But I would be curious to see as we move forward what the data shows. And more importantly, the problem I have is this. We've talked about a lot of data, and I told you before. Here's the thing. I, it's anecdotal, but it's not becoming anecdotal anymore. I am seeing more and more people who are vaccinated get very sick, get very sick and test positive for COVID. I am. I know a guy right now been sick for three weeks, got the Pfizer vaccination. And I believe he got a booster, not 100%. But regardless, the Pfizer vaccination and is sick for three weeks. And I asked the question, we look at sort of this dashboard of information that, that doesn't get onto the level of just, here's how many COVID positives there were. Here's how many beds are being uh, used up totally. It doesn't break it down how many of that percentage is COVID. Here's how many ventilators here's how all this we we get these kind of high level very generalized numbers and we never see the underlying data and if you know anything it's really important to see that underlying data because it actually shows important trends either one way or another 
And the problem with that was, as I always said, is the narrative was every time there was a positive COVID test, the assumption because of the narrative that was being pushed out was it was an unvaccinated person. And the problem with that is if you're not really paying attention and realizing, oh, at some point, there's the numbers don't add up. Not every person that gets tested and is pops positive for COVID is unvaccinated because the numbers just don't correlate. You can't have day after day after day after day after day of high numbers of positive tests and yet only be the unvaccinated. And we started to see some of those numbers come out. It wasn't until later, it wasn't until a couple of weeks ago, but we started to see through a survey from an organization that was doing the um, monoclonal antibodies that they did their own internal survey to find out who was using their early prevention treatment. And so sh- to, not to a shock to me, because I felt like this was the trend, but maybe to a shock to others, the majority of them were vaccinated. And some of them even had their first booster. So we weren't getting all the answers. We weren't getting all the real data. And nobody course corrected the narrative in the mainstream media to make it very clear that there's no way that every positive test of COVID that was coming out day after day were not just unvaccinated people, but were vaccinated people as well. That was never mentioned. Because it defeats the narrative. Well, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to rest on the COVID stuff, and I want to move into some of the uh, state politics thing. Jamie Allard has announced that she is going to run for House District 22. That's right, Jamie Allard. Uh, for many who are conservative and Republican here in the Anchorage municipality, many, like Jamie, many feel that she represents them, not just Chugiak Eagle River, but many of the conservatives in Anchorage as well. Uh, She has filed with the Alaska Public Office Commission as a candidate for House District 22. It's a newly drawn political district. And the lines really cover a lot of Eagle River. I'm going to read from this article, which is entitled, She's All That, Jamie Allard Announces for Eagle River House District 22. Allard, who has served for 18 months on the Anchorage Assembly, said she plans to represent the values of Eagle River residents in the state capitol in Juneau. And as a Republican, she will work to make sure that Republicans, who are the numeric majority in the House, regain the actual majority, which has been eroded by members caucusing with the Democrats. She said she would continue to serve as a Uh, on the assembly until January 2023. Now, I'm sure many of you out there are very bummed because Jamie Allard has been the, not 100% of the time, but it sort of feels like she's the sole voice of conservatism and Republican values. Crystal Kennedy fills that gap at times as well. Not all the time, but I would say a fair amount. Whereas most of the people on the assembly are highly left-leaning liberal individuals who do not hold the same values of conservatism and Republican, uh, Republican values at all. That's just not the case. So I, I am 100% sure there's going to be a lot of people who are going to be very upset about this. Allard says this, More efficient government is a core value for Eagle River. We also see public safety and economic opportunities to be priorities, not infighting among legislators. We want our self-determination respected, not controlled by those who don't share our family values. I'll guard our constitutional rights, including our Second Amendment rights, with every ounce of my being, she said. Now, she she is going to be endorsed by some very prominent conservative Republican individuals. But here's the question, you know, and and it's something that I've posed to you, our listening audience out there. And when I read this article, I immediately brought it back to my mind. It almost feels a little hopeless within the Anchorage municipality when it comes to ever regaining at least a 50-50 split within the assembly. And that might just be because it's dark out, it's winter, it's cold. But the way things are going, it feels like 
this city is turning bluer and bluer. And I don't know if that's a fact, but I know what doesn't help, which is some of the legislation and process changes that were done, I think, foolishly and, frankly, intentionally to continue to keep the Anchorage Assembly and many, the, for example, the mayor, blue, to keep it left-leaning Democratic. I don't have the graph right now, and we're going to have to put it on Must Read Alaska. You know, I, I think I said this before. I must re- write an article about this, but here's the deal. There was a kind of a GIF animation that shows who would have won the 2016 election. That was the Hillary Trump election. If only mail-in votes were counted. Now, not absentee, mail-in votes. And it was overwhelmingly, when I say overwhelmingly, Trump received in that scenario one electoral vote. That's it. So it's pretty clear that mail-in voting absolutely favors Democrat candidates. It's just, it's just the way it is. I mean, the data is there. So to change an election system to mail-in voting is absurd. And we've had guests on that shared the experience of mail-in voting, the fact that it is so difficult and cost, it's still not as cost-effective as going to the polls. And also, the amount of gaffe and ridiculousness, that is, the shenanigans that are involved in it, is really difficult to set aside. Go in, circle a dot, watch them scan it. That should be it. One vote for one person. And yet we continue down this road. All right, well, I didn't get to one topic today that we'll probably touch on tomorrow. Um, you know, I might have Suzanne join me on a Friday to talk a little bit about this. But uh, I want to talk a little bit about uh, the gubernatorial race here in Alaska how that's shaping up, uh, some of the things that are being talked about. And, and listen, don't think the Democrats are not gearing up for this jungle primary slash ranked choice voting. They are, they are neck deep in strategy for this. And we're going to talk a little bit about that tomorrow. But, guys, thank you so much for joining with me today. There's a lot to talk about. In my mind, you have to understand, my mind is going 100 miles an hour because there's so many things that we could talk about in terms of just ridiculousness, the lack of self-awareness, the double standards. I mean, it, at some point, the Republicans have to make their rules and not play by the Democratic rules. And that's just kind of what I've come to lately. And you'll know that yesterday when I ranted about that. We've got to start calling spades a spades. And, I, and I'm hoping to see that, not just at the national level, but the state and local level as well, because this is absurd. It's absurd. And so my little, you know, again, I'm, I am not thrilled with what I'm seeing right now. But I do have hope. I do have hope. As I've watched Virginia, as i watched Pennsylvania, as i watched, again, how close the New Jersey governor's race was, uh, I do have hope. And I do think people are tired of uh, being used and, and frustrated with certain policies and certain ideologies. And I just, I hope people use their vote as a voice. That's what I really hope. Well, if you haven't followed us on Facebook, I would recommend you do so. Uh, on YouTube, subscribe and hit the notification bell. We're on MeWe, Parler, Twitter, Rumble, all under the same particular handle, which is Must Read Alaska, all one word. Well, guys, uh, that was it for me today. We'll be with you tomorrow. Until then, take care, Alaska. Alaska.